King of Podcasts Radio Network proudly presents the Broadcasters Podcast. Here is the King of Podcasts. And welcome to another Broadcasters Podcast. This is King of Podcasts here with you. Year number six of the program begins now. And I believe this is episode 311. We're going to be here at 312, 312 here in the program. Thanks for listening in. Finding the shows you always do, kingofpodcasts.com. So we're going to get into my bread and butter. And am I looking right now just on the website for all the past episodes that I've done of the program? I mean, it's at least a good 250 episodes that I've always talked about something when it comes to radio or, you know, a plenty of times where I've talked about radio in general. And the reason why, as opposed to doing other things where I could talk about movies and TV and music and Stories in the current ether right now, pop culture, Cat Williams interview with Shannon Sharp on Club Shay Shay, talking about all the various comedians and all the different artists that are out there. Cat Williams is basically just being ruthless and relentless and no filter. Quite an interesting interview. But I mean, I could go on with that. Sure. I could talk about, you know, the it's just when it comes to the decline of movies and, and what they're having right now. Oh, we can talk about the Star Wars changes that are going to be going on right now. They're going to go ahead and do another part of the Star Wars saga and continue that. They've announced a new director for that. That's getting a lot of talk right now. We can talk about all that, sure. But no, no. It, tonight, I'm going to stick to my guns and talk about what really started this program in the first place. Way back in 2018. And that was radio. And For those that just need a quick refresher, I worked in radio initially. My first time is going to be coming up. I'm actually going to be celebrating my 30th anniversary in media coming up now. And it goes back to Super Bowl Sunday of 1994. So the exact day of that, that would be Super Bowl 28. And it was... The Cowboys and the Buffalo Bills. Right. Was that game? Oh my goodness. Wow. January 30th, 1994. That would be my first time ever in front of a microphone broadcasting. First chance to do it. So January 30th will be my 30th anniversary in media, 30th anniversary in radio in some way, shape, or form. And podcasting, I still count it as radio. Even though I haven't been on a radio signal on FM or AM, AM dial, what, since 2019, which was fun when I got the chance to do that. But like I said, yeah, things has changed. And we decided to go and go this route. And I'll tell you, so much has changed in radio since I got started. Because it was a different time. Radio wasn't deregulated. You know, we had stations that were starting to change up. And we had a, obviously a, a setting of how radio stations were operated and who owned them. There were a number of small or regional companies that owned radio stations. Cause let me tell you the, the landscape of radio ownership in 1994 was so different. When I think of the number of companies that we used to have, I mean, I think about what was it in 1994 in West Palm beach alone, we had what? Ardmore Broadcasting, we had Southern Star Communications, we had American Radio Systems, we had a lot of independent owners, and it was just a different time. And of course, we had Infinity Broadcasting, we had, you know, other stations with ownership, BZ Broadcasting, Chancellor Group, Salem Media, so many others back in the day. But it was really so wide range. And so many different formats of stations at that time as well. So much of a difference from all that time back then. But when I look at where things are right now today, and it's just not the same as it was anymore. And it's a shame. I wish we had a better way to go with how it was. And in 1994, oh my goodness, the, uh, the amount of people that were out there doing broadcasts at that time, we had Jack Cole, and Lee and Jim Edwards and, you know, Randy Rhodes. And, you know, I mean, think about who we had back then. I mean, you know, of the powerful 
radio giants at that time. Howard Stern was on, Opie and Anthony was on. But the Love Sponge was doing his show at that time at 98 Rock, right? I think he had already left Power Pig by then, right? I think it was already by that time. Or he might have been still at FLZ right beforehand and then moved over to 98 Rock. That's right. I think that's what it was. And I think about Neil Rogers was on back in those days. And Phil Henry was local here. And Hank Goldberg. And I'm like, oh my God, the talk radio talent, the music radio talent here from Kid Curry. Well, the Power 96 crew in general, you know, pick who they had over there. You know, if it was Cox and Radio or Ty Laz and Bo, right? Or was, yeah, Ty Laz and Bo or Mindy and Bo, get up and go, right? And we had, you know, so much going on. Wait, was Bobby? What was it? Uh, Footy and the Chicks of Six around that time? No, no, it wouldn't have been there yet. But, you know, Footy was still on the air and James T was doing the morning show at 99 Jams and like all this stuff was just doing different, right? It was just a different time. A lot of variety of programming, a lot of excitement and a lot of interest. And the Love Doctors were a big thing right back then too. Oh my goodness, it was so good. And radio across the board was so good. A lot of radio shows in their prime. 30 years later, nothing. It's so much different now. And I hate it. I, I hate that we are now at this point where, I mean, a little under 30 years, corporatism, this idea of all these big radio companies that were created out of combined companies from before, okay? Odyssey just becoming a name after Intercom and CBS combined in a merger. iHeartRadio, where you had clear channel stations combined with J-Corp, combined with Chancellor Media, and I forget whether EMFM networks and all these other na- networks together combined that were bought thanks to Bud Paxson, who did a lot of the work in the mid-90s to put that together and sell it off the clear channel. And how well these stations done since then? They really haven't pr- put a lot of profit. In some ways, they've done, done, tried to look through, at other routes of trying to expand their revenue or try to maintain or something while abandoning and continue to abandon the radio signals that they own, which the, by the way, the listeners, okay, Americans own the airways. We don't have control over that. And radio now is just more jukebox, much more commercialized than before. I mean, sure. Commercials need to be operated in order to go ahead and be able to run the programming. Sure, absolutely. But there's not even an effort done now on radio to make it better. But that's also across with television and also with cable and also fast channels, all that. It's just changed altogether. And this was continued to go along until we got to a point where, you know, and media companies at this size... They're doomed to fail. And it's normal. The idea that radio stations that could make so much money if they were be, if they were run right and they just continue to go ahead and get dropped down and just continue to go across and, you know, it's... They're allowed to be continued to be... They, they want to continue to go ahead and drop... More and more all the time. Why? Why do we have to go through this route in the first place? Because I don't know. But I really hate it. And it wasn't that long ago where bankruptcies were going along in everything. I mean, 2018, when I first started the program back in March... We had a lot of problems with bankruptcy. It was a major issue. But we've gone through this across the board. If I want to go and talk about all these different companies that were out there, okay, of the major corporations that all fell apart and then other companies would just buy it up. One of the biggest ones was Citadel Media. Citadel on December 20th, 2009, okay, they filed for bankruptcy. And this is, remember, after 1996, 
and the allowance of the Federal Communications Commission to allow deregulation where there was a no cap on how many radio stations people could have owned, right? And this is being allowed 15 years later. Reuters reported that December 21st, 2009, Citadel Broadcasting filed for Chapter 11. Brought low by the drop in advertising revenue and crushing debt loads. And a lot of radio companies are actually going through it. And they're not getting reported on it because the radio industry protects itself. There's not a lot of bad press out there on radio. And I might, I might be one of the full, one of the really honest, critical people when it comes to radio. And I do this as a service because I am pissed about it. It, it, it breaks my heart to see that the medium that I love, like the reason a lot of podcasters are on this platform now is because we don't have radio to go to because it's not as if we couldn't try to get our way into radio. I mean, I'm sure I could get into a radio station now, but we don't have the freedom. We don't have the creativity. We don't have the chance to go ahead and really make a difference. And we can't do the business that worked for decades. Radio always had to change. Remember, it was, you know, talk and it was also another format before. It was for television. When te- before television, it was the medium to go to. It had to change in the 50s and 60s, and it did. And it changed again in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and it did again. Radio was evolving a lot. It stood with the times. It would change. And a lot of people made their bones by getting into radio and becoming successful coming out of radio. But it would always be other people coming in to fill the void. Plenty of people be in radio. I guarantee you right now, if radio was a much better place, there would be a lot of people working in radio. A lot. They wouldn't have a problem going to a radio station, to the studios, and going there. Over the weekend, I was actually thinking about this. I almost thought about putting this on Twitter or X about a poll as to what was the one project. Okay. If it was maybe a, it was a movie or a TV show, something like that, that prompted you to go on the radio in the first place that made you interested in the radio. Okay. And I can, I'm sure I can give you a number of examples. We could use, go back to FM 1978. We can go to talk radio. Eric Bogosian, what, 1987? We could use, you know, I my example, the reason I got on the radio in the first place was Christian Slater, Samantha Mathis, Ellen the Green, and the movie Pump of the Volume, 1990, right? Happy Hard Harry, right? And, you know, the song Everybody Knows by Leonard Cohen still strikes a chord because I'm still into it because that's how he started his show. And the, the the rebellion, just the the free form that he had on there was so much fun. That made me interested in radio. And, of course, I even did pirate radio for a while as a result of it. Right? And that was very early on. We could use news radio as the latest example, which would have still lasted very long if not for Phil Harmon's death, untimely passing. WKRP in Cincinnati, we can absolutely use that. I got onto it late, but I absolutely love that show. It's a shame it didn't go longer than it did, but also the problem was that they had a lot of issues when it came to you know CBS not putting enough faith into the show and moving the show around, what, four or five times in the entire run of the series? But it did make it for five seasons. And it made the syndication quota to be able to run a syndication. And it was running for a long time in syndication. You can still find it. So all that was wonderful. But that kind of radio is not here now. We don't have that. And listen, even a couple of years ago, radio was still doing okay with a number of reasons. I mean, you you might not like it, but conservative radio was doing really well. Because of the fact that there was quite a spotlight on it because of the likes of Rush Limbaugh. And then others, you know, needed to go ahead and fill the void that he had, right? There are still some successes in radio, very, very few. Coast to Coast AMs would be one example that people will still listen to at night and still gets an audience, you know? But it's all changed. But 15 years ago, we go back to the time when Citadel 
was one of the first companies that was combining all these other companies that came in. All right. So they came out of that and it was a big issue. Citadel at the time operated and owned 224 stations and they made a deal with more than 60% of its senior lenders to convert their secured credit facility into a new term loan of $762.5 million. And the bankruptcy was to wipe out $1.4 million in debt, $1.4 billion in debt, excuse me. And Citadel in court documents would talk about how shareholders would be wiped out. This is 2009. Who's buying into, into radio stocks? It's amazing that it happens. And at the time, Citadel had total assets of $1.4 billion and debts of $2.5 billion. It didn't have enough money. And the buyout firm was Forsman Little and Company. They had 29% of the company's shares. Because remember, these companies don't own it all outright by themselves. With the public trading, they also have equity firms that continue to be along as normal. And this is what the problems we were having at that time. At that time, let's go and fast forward. Forbes to 2018. A lot of stations here complaining, a lot of stations being put up. Radio Inc. even putting a point where they talked about how there were 1,300 radio stations under bankruptcy at the point of 2018. Because then what happened was Cumulus Media would buy Citadel, they would merge, and Cumulus would put their name on top of it. And back in 2018, iHeartRadio had 850 stations. Cumulus had 445. Out of 11,300 AM and FM stations in America, at that time, 11% of those stations were owned by these two networks. And there were people in the industry at that time, five years ago, or now six years ago, that wanted the, the these people, these industry bigwigs to fail. Not because they wanted to see, not because they wanted to see them fail. They say, but they they see light at the end of a long dark tunnel. The two big companies are finally facing the elephant and the room, working on plans to shed over twenty two billion dollars in debt that for years have been kicked down the road. Well, it hasn't changed much. Now Bob Pittman, you know, I usually like to go ahead and go after him, and Mary Burner, who was at Cumulus Media at the time. You know, when Mary Burner took over Cumulus. They were dealing with $2 billion in debt. And Bob Pittman, he came in with his debt to deal with, a massive debt load. Unable to move the needle, he decided to change this company into a multimedia platform giant. So that, let's get it into podcasts. Let's get into audio and change it up. But bankruptcy was in the play. And Citadel would be bought out and they can get their debt taken care of. Cumulus would take on and get their own debt and also have to deal with their own issues and move along. And the Cumulus media eventually also had their own issues with having the drop off. Because they had their own issues of bankruptcy after that. So going back to them, Cumulus media before that, had Chapter 11 bankruptcy, $2.4 billion in debt. And they emerged with a debt balance of $1.3 billion. And then on June 4, 2018, they came out of bankruptcy. The debt balance, once again, $1.3 billion. So Citadel, Cumulus, five years ago, six years ago, same thing. And Cumulus at the time, they actually owned 446 stations in 90 markets. And Citadel Broadcasting was one they, they owned before, the Lou, the Dickey family, Lou and John Dickey, right? At that time, they had bought Citadel Broadcasting in 2011, valued at $2.5 billion. The Dickey family, which according to the Atlanta Journal's Constitution, they said that the Dickies did not invest properly in programming and labor, and both ratings and revenues suffered. Mary Burner came in and reduced the point to her from 50% a year to 24%, and Moves to morale, supposedly, and she pr sold the private lane, pr 
private plane that the Dickies that owned Cumulus was using and used it to raise pay for employees. But no matter what, they continued to go ahead and fall apart. In 2017, they had a $206 million loss. The year before, $543 million. And revenue fell slightly from year to year. But everybody keeps seeing this here. Now, you know what? It's the continuous problem that we have. And it doesn't get better. So back to higher heart radio. Was that it's iHeartMedia had the same problem that everybody, all these companies have today missed an interest payment. And I'm sure if I go ahead and put a story up that just says about their debt right now, here we are, December 2022. Okay, we're talking about that though. And their debt at the moment was $5.41 billion in debt, December 2022. That was. Then and then, the net debt now is at more at five point oh seven billion. So it's a slight change. Still, it's a lot. And let's go to the, let's go to Seeking Alpha that talks about this. iHeartMedia as a stock, disappointing total return of eighty negative eighty five point six percent since emerging from bankruptcy in twenty nineteen. The core radio broadcasting business has faced secular declines. Advertising. And a shift away from traditional media towards digital media. See, these are the same problems as before. Radio has the same damn problems as always. No ad revenue. How many more years? Okay, that was 2009 I talked about with Citadel. And 2011. And 2018. And 2019. How many more times can radio just use debt and just say, well, you know, the ad revenue is still not there. You haven't had an answer for that yet. No one has a solid answer to that. Bob Pittman with the biggest company out there, this is that we're going to multi-platform. That's our excuse. So you're going to have some other parts of the company that are going to be viable. Meanwhile, but his plan is that, you know, the radio stations are all being held up as collateral. But they're just, they're being held up and they're kind of keep being propped. And they're probably waiting for somebody to go ahead and just take it off of them. Because the podcast division with Bob Pittman wants to hold on to. Plus some other areas that he has when it comes to the festivals that help uh, generate revenue for them. But, That's the ad revenue they might get for those particular events. Like their the jingle balls, you know, their summer, uh, the, the, the music festival they have every year. I think it's in August in Las Vegas. Okay. They can get some big national sponsors for that. Sure. But then you look at what about the rest of the year? No, less money coming up from corporate companies and ad agencies for advertising. It's getting a lot less. We're hearing a lot more ads of promos and, and things for these radio stations themselves taking away. But then the other idea is that, well, then these radio stations are going to continue to go and play the same load of ads without having ads that are paid for. Because they think that they're going to go ahead and replenish those ad loads, the amount of you know spots that they're going to have, that they'll be able to get five, six, seven, eight minutes worth of ads to fill in at some point. Maybe things the ad business will turn around, but it hasn't. And they also want to go ahead and diversify and, and you know create parallel individual ad revenue streams. Oh, the live stream, that's a different revenue stream. The AM, FM dial, that's a different revenue stream. The podcast is a different revenue stream. The individual stations, well, we might put ads on there, but we'll just put it up as a cluster. We're not going to put it as an individual station. We're not going to target the audience. We're just going to put your ads everywhere, basically. As we look at them, the S&P 500, in the same period since 2019, has returned back 63.5%. Meanwhile, iHeartRadio and their stock ticker, on NASDAQ, IHRT, 85.6%, negative 85.6%. Continued secular declines, and it's also the same thing with their closest peers, Cumulus Media and Odyssey, which right now, Odyssey, by the way, earlier this year, earlier, earlier last year in 2023, they got delisted. And that's another thing we're dealing with as well, that we have companies that are getting delisted off the stock exchange because they can't hold a dollar in stock. Their, their shares are not even selling for a dollar each. 
so Odyssey is now a pink stock. It's an OTC stock. And if you look at where they are right now, let me tell you this. So currently, Odyssey is selling at 19 cents a share. 19 cents. Highest was $11.36. That's pitiful. iHeart, currently, selling at $2.40 as of record today. Their highest at $9.01. Yeah. And then Cumulus Medium, they're at $5.01. Their highest was at $7.30. No? Okay. These, these, these companies are all in their own same bed as they were before. And let's look at the returns on the other radio networks. Okay, Town Square Media is another one. It's 60, 67% value that they've gotten. So it's kind of gone been going up, but it's a smaller company on the come up. I heard radio down negative 85%. Odyssey down negative 99%. Communist Media down negative 72%. Yeah. But that's where we are. And then they have the thing where they're the number one audio media company right now. They have AM, FM broadcast radio stations, digital radio. So I don't even know if HD radio is also included in that. Satellite radio is also in their part. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Heart Radio app. They have their multi-platform group, digital audio group, and the audio media services group. Digital audio down 28% for total revenue. And that's all the digital business, including podcasts. So the podcasting division down 28%. Media representation, broadcast software scheduling services. So the audio media services group, which is these are all these platforms that iHeartMedia bought from other companies. So next gen profit, you know, their news gathering service. They bought these companies outright and they're holding them now at a negative. And the multi-platform group is their traditional broadcast radio down 66% total revenue. That's for broadcast radio. Networks, sponsorships, events businesses, down 66%. Sure, they're the number one podcast publisher in the U.S., but they're not making money on it. They're not making money on it at all. And as we said, we could talk about the companies that they own in terms of technology. They own Radio Jar, RCS, Triton, Omni Studio, Jelly, Voxnest, Media Matters, all these other ones, right? They could talk about all that. But it changes. And traditional radio continues to go on a very big problem. And this is the problem. Struggling to generate consistent revenue growth. Yeah, they're not going to make money on the on the political ads. They, they might expect on that. And, you know, when I used to hear what was it, what, a podcast called All Things Radio, they used to go ahead and give the report on the quarterly numbers they would get on advertising and how much it would grow or lose in their points, but it didn't. Maybe 1%, maybe 2% growth on advertising. In some cases, quarter to quarter. But that doesn't happen much anyway. For Heart Radio itself, third quarter 2023. Total revenue, $952.98 million. Decline, 3.6% year over year. Net loss, $8.97 million. You know, what else do you expect? They said the fourth quarter revenue was going to be declining by high single digits. Uh, and the company was expecting their EBITDA to be $205 million to $215 million. They're just not making enough money for anything for them to get themselves together. And the debt, they're still $5 billion in debt. $5.2 billion in total debt. So they're taking their debt off, but how long is it going to take for them to get there? Okay. They're targeting a net leverage ratio of four times, but the company repurchased 89 million of their senior notes, 8.375% senior unsecured notes, it generated $45 million of cash from the sale of remaining broadcast radio towers to pay down the debt. Yeah, they don't even own the towers anymore. Now they lease them. That's also not counting the amount of property and buildings they sold as well to pay down the debt. Do you understand? They might be paying down the debt. It might have been, you know, at $20 billion. And then they got the you know, restructuring and bankruptcy. They came out of it in 2019 at 5.7. Again, they're down to $5.0 billion. And what have they done to get $700,000, $700 million off? 
sell the radio towers, continue just to pick off the bones like vultures. They continue just to take away. They continue to take away, and it doesn't matter to them. They don't care. It's pathetic. Now, we don't need to move on a little bit into the, to the current state, but as I said, we're just going through a cross here. Significant debt's maturing in 2026, 2.26 million in term loans, $800 million of secured, secured, senior secured notes. So, yeah, in two years' time, they're going to have three point, they're going to have three mil, three billion dollars. They're going to have to make sure they pay up. I'm not counting the interest they're paying on this as well. And there are some people in the stock market that still think there's value to iHeartRadio. Well, there is to their property. But you're talking about a company that's poorly managing this property. Poorly managing it. Now, one of the things that's being talked about as well, which is not good here, Seeking Alpha actually put the story out back in the third quarter of 2023 that while iHeart was in bankruptcy, Apple had supported buying a stake in the company to boost the streaming service. iHeart could be a potential acquisition target for Sirius XM Holdings, but now Liberty Media has bought out the Sirius XM. Spotify was considered a potential acquisition target. But iHeart could be attracted to other companies, and their high level of debt would be making it fairly difficult for a transaction to happen outside of bankruptcy court. Who's going to take on their debt? Who's going to take that company and take the $5 billion in debt? I mean, this should not be allowed. This company is not going to find a buyer. They're not going to pay down their debt. Let me just, this is not a prediction. This is a spoiler. iHeart Media I predict, I spoil, I'm pretty sure they're not going to pay their debt off. They are never going to become solvent. They will not be cash flow positive to the point where they're going to have their debt cleared. That will never happen. That will never happen. And it doesn't matter because it's being allowed this way. And that's because the equity firms that also own a stake in these companies, especially like Heart Media. They enjoy the interest they're making off of them. They're making money off the interest just to hold them afloat, hold them afloat, and they allow and they tolerate the debt that continues to be there. Because those equity firms, they don't care about getting rid of the debt. They don't care. Again, they're going to make some a little bit of profit or whatever. They're going to make off the the towers, all that. Put that towards the debt. But that doesn't mean they're going to take a little bit of a take of themselves. Like they'll go ahead and use that money to go ahead and pay down the debt. But still. They're not going to turn that uh, that property into a. They're not going to turn that company into a profit because the equity firms they don't care about turning the company into a profit. But they can go and get their interest payments taken care of and collect money off of holding the bag on this network of stations, all these these radio stations that they have. It doesn't matter for them; they just care care less. Now, according to the people who are seeking alpha, for those that thought it would be a good idea to go ahead and, you know, buy into the stock and, and you know, buy or sell. So the writer here says that the structural headwinds currently facing iHeartMedia are only likely to accelerate over the next few years, and there's concern about the company's ability to generate profits in 2025 and beyond. The company has relatively limited room for an error given the very high debt load and significant maturities in 2026. Again, $3 billion will be have to be ponied up. They will not have the money. They will not get their billion. They were not, they were not going to, especially not going to go ahead and by 2026, they will not have paid down their debt down. They'll still be, they'll still be $2.7 billion in debt. They're going to still be in the, in the debt. They're not going to pay that off. And then this writer says he's initiating coverage with a sell rating, but consider upgrading the stock of their earnings outlook improves due to strength in the digital business and the company's able to deliver its balance sheet. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. But it's allowed to go along with this. Allowed to go along with this. And it just continues. In 2018, I heard filed for bankruptcy, last minute creditor deal, 
to continue to move along as they did, and it didn't make a difference, right? And there were so many stories that came out about that at the time. And of course, there's other media companies that are also going through the same thing, but this is the same thing as always before. And Liberty Media was interested in buying iHeartMedia, but they decided to go with Sirius. And Sirius is trying to restructure it now, and they're actually doing pretty good. I'll give them credit. That is the one bastion of radio that is still left, but it's a premium. You're making money off the subscription, not on the advertising. The latest culprit now. Yes, I know it took time to get here, about 35 minutes, but you know what? It was worth it. Odyssey. A-U-D-A-C-Y. A-C-Y. Wall Street Journal is reporting that they're gearing up for, fi- for, na- for financial bankruptcy in the coming weeks. We're going to take from we're going to take from Wall Street Journal right now and talk about what they're saying at this moment about it before everything else. And they have a section on their website for bankruptcy. So here's what we got so far. Their declining ad revenue has made their network unable to service their $2 billion debt load. They've reached an agreement with senior lenders for a prepackaged bankruptcy plan. And they'll provide financing for the proceedings and are expected to own the company following the restructuring. Now, before everything else comes up, let me go ahead and take from Inside Radio that first report on the story and what was going on with this in the first place. Because more than anything else off the bat, they were already struggling. So we mentioned this, and this is, I want to just make sure to make the point of what they've been going through already before they got themselves in this point. So here it is. Because right now they're citing concerns over their capacity to meet debt obligations based on the revenue forecast for 2024. They're missing interest payments on senior loans starting in October. And the company had to secure consent from lenders for a grace period. Now, listen to this part. In December, Odyssey signed a 12th amendment to its credit agreement, giving it another 68 days to reach an agreement without sliding into a technical default on $18.9 million in loans that would have come due by the end of last month. 12 amendments. So this is basically you're just kicking the ball, kicking the can down the road. 12 different times they had to ask for an extension. Extension. Third quarter results in early November were reported and that Odyssey CEO David Field said the company was in constructive conversations with lenders to recapitalize the company and chart a path through what would be choppy financial waters. And in 2024, right, $926.4 million of debt is set to mature. The quarterly report says if it's unable to reach a deal with lenders, it may need to file for bankruptcy protection. So this is at the end of the year, 2023, $9.264 million in debt maturing. Time to pay it. They don't have the money for it. Now, the history of the company starts off as it was Intercom Communications in 1968. Merger with CBS Radio. Company rebranded its Odyssey in 2021. They own 235 stations in 48 markets and streaming services through their mobile app. Yep. And they still own Radio.com, by the way. I believe they still own that. Now back into Odyssey. Revenues decrease, net losses have widened due to lower advertising spending, we said. And the stations there are broadcast music, news, sports, and streaming services. Such a bad state right now. Besides the Wall Street Journal and other radio sources, a couple others have actually talked about it. Abyss Journals have actually brought it up right now as well. Philadelphia Business Journal reported on this because a lot of the th- local media talked about it. That's the, we're, most, of you're gonna, most of your coverage on Odyssey is going to be at. Given that payment in late in September, Sauton received several extensions. If lenders take ownership of the company, they can make changes to Odyssey's board of management that can reach as high as the chairman and CEO, David Field. Existing shareholders will be eliminated without getting anything in return if lenders can control. 
and longtime shareholders would be unable to recoup severe losses over in his recent years as the company's stock prices declined from $17 a share when CBS when the CBS radio merger came to 19 cents as of Wednesday afternoon. Wow. Yeah, horrible. So the prepackaged plan for bankruptcy would be a plan and a disclosure statement drafted and submitted to creditors for approval prior to the filing. And senior lenders will usually agree to a compromise such as restructuring debt at a lower amount. Lenders will provide financing during the bankruptcy. And there's a lot of thought in here that it'll be more than a few days for Odyssey to emerge from Chapter 11. Now, going back to 2019, Odyssey, once the, you know, everything happened with all their issues, they were trying to do a few things with Odyssey, try to go ahead and be aggressive in the radio space or the podcast space as well. So first of all, they acquired producer Pineapple Street Media in 2019, 55% of Cadence 13, and then bought the rest of it. And then they also bought QL Gaming Group, a, a sports betting technology and analytics firm for $32 million and podcasting ad tech platform Podcorn. So yeah, buying all these platforms and all these different companies probably didn't help much. And as of September 30th, their third quarter report says they had $57.4 million in cash or cash equivalents. Enough cash to cover the debt in the coming months, but still more debt to pay down. Again, with almost a million, a billion dollars set to mature this year. When the Aussie deal came into play, first of all, the company called Entercom at the time in 2017 paid $1.5 billion for CBS Radio to be acquired and then added $1.4 billion in debt to Odyssey's $439 million in debt already in the books. That would make them the second largest radio company owner of the company, and they moved the corporate offices and six local stations to new headquarters in Philadelphia. And new investments in podcasting related technology before the pandemic dealt a significant blow to advertising revenue. And last year, their stock was delisted from the stock exchange after share price went below the $1 listing requirement for the New York Stock Exchange. They tried to regain compliance with New York's, the NYSE requirements, putting a 1 for 30 reverse stock split of the company's Class A and Class B common stocks. But market capitalization has gone from $2.3 billion to $885,000. Wow. Pathetic. Now, Odyssey is going to try to cut costs by renegotiating leases, selling assets to some of its 20, 220 stations across the country. They're not going to sell the stations. They're going to sell some of their assets and renegotiate leases where these stations are held. Salem Media Group is an also a company that also owns a bunch of stations. They are voluntarily delisting for the NASDAQ Stock Exchange after falling out of compliance for listing. Let's bring that story up. That was offered from Talkers Magazine to talk about that. So they're going to voluntarily delist their Class A common stock for the NASDAQ global market and deregister the Class A common stock under the Securities Exchange Act. Their last trading day will be January 18, 2024. Pretty bad. But they're also going to take themselves off. The common stock is expected to go ahead and go to the OTC markets, the pink stocks. Once again, same thing as before. And then another radio network is also dealing with the same problem as well. Urban One. Now, Urban One, they, they own a number of prominent black-owned and black-programmed uh, radio stations. Urban One was originally uh, Radio One, but also we had TV One at the time. So they were able to halt the listing procedures against the company. In July, Urban One switched firms to Ernst & Young for accounting 
assisting in the quarterly submission of their quarterly report. And their submission of the quarterly report allowed to rectify the last outstanding issues requiring a cessation on trading. So they got a new firm to come in. Ernst & Young's the ones that always give out the, is it the Oscars? They're always the ones that hold the, the envelopes. But by reworking the quarterly report for the fourth quarter, Urban One was able to go ahead and keep themselves on the NASDAQ, keep their stock from being delisted. But right now, NASDAQ is putting close scrutiny on Urban One under a mandatory panel monitor. And they're expected to maintain ongoing compliance with the periodic filing rule. And any failure to comply would result in stricter consequences. Another filing violation, and the company will not have the option to present a new compliance plan. They will just directly face delisting with the opportunity to request a hearing in the initial hearing panel or a new panel if necessary. And then there's Beasley Broadcast Group. Well, doesn't get a whole lot of press either, but this was from the Naples Daily News reporting on this. And in this, they talk about the fact that for the second time in November 2023, they were being warned that their stock could be delisted. There was a written notice by NASDAQ that said that it was dated October 13th that the stock traded below the minimum required $1 for 36 consecutive days in violation of the rules. And they got a notice like that in April 2023. They have until April 2024 to regain compliance. And the share price must close at least at a minimum of $1 for at least 10 consecutive business days by then. And if it doesn't happen, they can still get 180 days the extension to meet any requirements, transferring it to the NASDAQ capital market designed for smaller companies with less stringent listing restrictions. The same thing as always, once again, they are struggling. Now, in their case... Beasley Broadcast Group, they have their own debt issues. They did reduce that by $13 million this year. But if I want to go and go through their current issues right now, latest financial results for the third quarter, they reported losses at $67.5 million or 225 a share. Profits were $500,000 or two cents a share a year ago. Busy Broadcast owns 59 AM and FM stations, 13 large mid, large and mid-sized markets in the United States, including Southwest Florida. But again, they're also hitting their own issues with debt. Currently, as of September 2023, $283.6 million in debt at risk of being delisted. Urban One, we just talked about now, their debt, $0.74 billion currently. Salem Radio's debt, let's go into that. They had to go and sell off what was called their church products business. $30 million they sold it for. As of December 2022, they had $162.7 million in debt. All these radio companies, it looks like they're all in debt, all of them. And another stock website actually talked about their, their chances of being bankrupt or going to bankruptcy are 44% likely. There's that too. I mean, how many more examples do we need here of showing the ineptitude of all these companies going to debt and just continue to go in there and it doesn't change and no one's doing anything about it. And public radio, by the way, their own issues as well when they have their own thing, right? Public radio operates 1100 AM and FM stations total. By the way, 213 of their stations currently produce original local journalism. And that's it. Because there was a state of local news report that came out recently talking about the issues where public radio is not doing the service of doing anything for local content because they don't have it. So public radio 
with limited resources, they don't have enough to go and cover what they should. They did go and put out in terms of $500 million to go and support local news in 2023. But their outlook is bleak because local stations have heavy dependency on government funding and listening to the nations, and they might remain dependent on philanthropic, philanthropic funding and innovative collaborations and mergers to significantly reach their news deserts. But local, rate, local news is falling off the map in public radio. They don't have anything for that. By the way, National Public Radio only gets one, less than 1% of their annual annual operating budget from the Corporation for Public Broad, Broadcasting, by the way. Make that point, too. They don't have money to do anything for themselves either. Nothing like that. No answers. Nothing here. So what are we going to do about that? There's no answers here. I don't like that we're at this point, but this has to be pointed out. A spotlight has to be put on it. And radio is going to continue to go ahead and falter like this. And it's not going to matter. Again, I've shown you 15 years worth of evidence here. Just to make the point. They're all in the same boat. They're at the, the risk of being delisted from the stock exchange, from the, from the NASDAQ or you know New York Stock Exchange or whatever it is. And then on top of that, they're not making enough money to clear their debt. So they're all either at the verge of bankruptcy or going bankrupt. And I can tell you that this doesn't need to be happening. See, we're talking about a handful of radio net, radio companies that do, need, do not need to be any longer holding on to these radio stations. This is where I wish some action would happen where something will happen here where there's going to be some additional cost to operating these stations. Okay. Again, what are they doing to cut their debt? They're selling off leases. They're selling off radio towers. You know, they're cutting staff. They're doing all the things except trying to make more money. All they're doing is taking the money they're taking and cutting on things less and making much more bargains than before. But they're not doing anything to answer the call of trying to turn these stations into profitable stations. Because there are profitable stations out there, by the way. But nobody's going to do anything about that. Nothing's been happening about that. No answer for this. Nothing. This is being tolerated. This is being allowed. And it's bullshit. I'm not happy about it. I just... I look at this and it disheartens me. This is what 2024 of radio is looking like. I mean, how much farther does radio need to go? This is why I need radio to implode. These big radio companies, 11% of radio stations out there, right? They own all the highest wattage, highest listened to, highest trafficked radio stations that are out there. And people are just tolerating the fact they're getting these stations that are at such a cost. You know, people are voice tracking or AI voice tracked or whatever there is now. And, you know, the ads are bad. The music rotations are bad. The playlists are very tight and they're not very creative. Like there's not much being done creatively to go and make these stations any better. The morning shows are shit. A lot of them. Okay. It's being tolerated. This has been allowed for too long. This is why the royalties issue for these stations, especially the music radio stations. This is where you need to go and see something will change, right? Where eventually music radio is going to have to go and take a big change because when the royalties come in, if we can get that local Radio Freedom Act coming in, the one that's not the NAB's plan, and the NAB loses their fight to stave off BMI and ASCAP, the copyrights royalties organizations, from getting extra money on royalties for songwriters, and then the artists themselves getting money off the royalties, and having to follow what streaming is doing right now to add more money to that. If that kind of, if those royalties come into play and it's too much for these companies to bear, then I want to see these, all these stations get sold off. That there will be no more measures that these companies can do except to sell the stations outright. At a discount, by the way. Because 
at a discount, then these radio stations can be sold off like a fire sale and local ownership can take over or at least some smaller owners that could do something with it. That's what I'm hoping for. Listen, in my market right now in West Palm Beach, I will tell you this. There are a couple of stations that are doing really well and doing something with themselves for the market is actually helping. Let me just bring this up. Just for my own sake, I'm going to bring up Nielsen ratings in West Palm Beach itself. Okay? Currently right now, in West Palm Beach, the market has already changed about who's running the market, and there's a lot of control right now. Hubbard Broadcasting is not a big network, not a big company, but they own a bunch of stations. They took over what was owned by CBS Radio out of the whole change of intercom, and then it was owned by Palm Beach Broadcasting, and then Hubbard Broadcasting came in and bought them. And currently right now, Hubbard Broadcasting owns a number of stations that are doing really well. WMBX, it's an adult R&B station, X102.3, having their highest numbers and ratings ever. But of course, it's an older audience. Playing R&B and throwbacks, it's working well for them. It's well run. They have local talent. WRMF, which is, they have a top radio, top morning show in the market with the KVJ show. Well, I know those guys personally, and I, I got to go and work alongside in the same building as them. Sunny 107.9, is still there, Kuwano cool 5.5, because they have the existing morning shows that have been around for a long time. And then some other stations are also doing pretty well off the bat, right? For instance, Glazer Media is a small company, and they own a regional Mexican station, which their ratings are going up because the popular popularity of Mexican music right now, of regional Mexican music, in the ether because you know, in pop cultures and gotten mainstream good for them. But that's what's going on with that. That's just in my, my, my market, just alone. Keeping that in mind. But that's some of the things we're worrying about right now that are not being changed. And, and people just need to understand that radio needs to go through some significant changes. We need these stations to be sold off. So I'm hoping more than ever that's going to finally happen. They will finally be coming. A reckoning for radio, for these big corporate radio companies to go down and to no longer hold these stations hostage. All these great radio stations that could be owned by other owners and new talent and new staff coming in. And then there's a chance for advertisers to come on. Listen, we know it can happen. We know it can happen. We take it like this. You know, one station is actually doing quite good right now in terms of getting some real numbers and, and some real popularity. WABC Radio. You know that? It's owned by a grocery store owner, John Casamatidis, Red Apple Media. And so far, that company is doing very well right now. And they are performing well. Now, Red Apple Media, by the way, they bought the BABC from Cumulus Media for $12.5 million. The company, okay, this small company that owns this one particular, they also own Red Apple Audio Network, so network radio division of the company, so they syndicate their programming. And since then, the company has invested in studios, expanding individual media, podcasts, and syndication. June 2022, there was a story from Inside Radio that talked about how the company was doing so much better. When Red, Red, Apple Media bought, Red Apple Media bought the station in 2019, the ratings were under two shares, and then they doubled to 3.8 in March. Chad Lopez, who's the WABC and WLRR president, said at the time they were going back to basics and formative entertaining the way we're delivering our content allows us to succeed with passion and enthusiasm. It's what radio was designed to do. Tell the story, have an audience listen, and stay with you. That's talk radio, by the way. That's talk radio. Because if you look at the BBC radio now, at the moment, their lineup is quite diverse. And listen, it's political talk. You can say what you want about it and not enjoy what they're doing, but they're doing pretty well with what they're doing. Okay? You have live programming, local programming, across the board. 
They're doing pretty well. And then have a full schedule of programming all across the board. And they're able to do it and do really well with it. They only have a couple of shows that are actually outside of that. But like again, they are, for the most part, live and local. For talk radio on AM, and it's doing pretty well. Some people have to realize that hey, there's something they're doing right. Just realize that. It's a big change. They reconstructed. Approach to news, talk, and politics. News is now much more objective. Their news is down the middle. Views from either side. And they have liberals and conservatives on their station. So liberal side, you got former New York Governor David Patterson, um, former Mayor Rudolph Giuliani on the conservative side. And the station, they say, succeeds by delivering hard topics in an informative, entertaining fashion. It's theater of the mind. We know if we've positioned a story one way, we're going to get people that may not necessarily agree with us. So let's hear what their views are. Peak interest the right way. We're not just shouting and screaming and going so far on one side or the other. And that's what they're doing. And it works for them. Right? And if you look at the ratings... I can look real quick and see what WPC doing is doing right now in terms of the ratings and what they've done so far. And I'll tell you right now what they're doing. Currently in New York, within the market, among talk radio stations, the only station ahead of them is WMYC in New York. But WBC right now is holding the ratings. 2.8 right now currently in December 2023. But again, this is the the... People, personal people meter ratings, which continues to go between what, 3.2, 3.1, 3.4, 3.1, 3.0, 2.8. That's normal because of the fact that you have shows that are going, you know, they're going in the reruns or going in with alternate programming or alternate hosts, you know, last two weeks of the year. So people are not really much in the news at the end of the year, but they were strong all the way up through election season. That was what works. They're queuing 439,000. For an AM radio station. So there are success stories. And I'm sure I can bring all the stations that will do the same thing. And what they're able to go and do to build for themselves. And they're able to go and put out there on a regular basis. Right? WTOP. Okay. Hubbard Radio owns them. Top billing radio station year after year. Making $69 million a year in 2022. And the closest competitor in 2022 was KISS FM, uh, iHeartMedia station, iHeartMedia radio station at $52 million. That's what they do. Radio can be done right. I mean, I got stations now that are in my market. Well, well we got oldies 103.7 and they don't have a podgepodge of programming, but it's a local group that owns it. Vic Canales Media Group is the, is the company that right now, VC, VCMG. We also have, what, Dick Robinson, who owns the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. And he runs Legends Radio here. That's very prominent and does very well. Live and local on both ends. They have live and local. That's what they're able to do. Okay, that's my program for the night. We talked all about radio. I had to get it off my chest. I'm sure we'll find some other content that comes out there that's in the, you know, pop culture kind of stuff, all the sleazy kind of stuff. We'll probably get to that soon enough and we'll talk about it once we get there. But in the meantime, that's the show for the night. Thank you for listening in as you always do. And, you know, as always, I love hearing from you. If you haven't checked the YouTube feed, you can find all my content there at YouTube at King of Podcasts. You can find it there as well. And just continue to listen in. There's so much going on this year that we have to talk about. What an amazing year in media we got coming up. Movies, we got big movies coming out. A lot of changes in the dynamic of TV and ra- uh, TV and movies and what's going to be happening with that. Music, obviously. Where are we going to go with that? Like so many changes. So come back next week for another Broadcasters Podcast. And remember that content is king. And the control of your content is in your hands. <laughs>